Hello everyone, we will continue on the course on computer aided drug design. We will talk about uh, some of the issues in the drug discovery process. So, let us uh, recap, uh, drug discovery is a process by which a drug candidate is identified okay, and partially validated for the treatment of a specific disease. So, uh, as I said partially validated because uh, it becomes a drug only after it gets approval from FDA that is a Food and Drug Administration of USA. So, in order to get approval uh, you need to go through all the various uh, um, preclinical trials involving uh, animals and then uh, human volunteer trials. So, until then it is called a lead molecule. So, uh, in my lab I may get uh, a nice uh, candidate uh, which looks very promising which shows very good activity in my activity screen maybe uh, anti inflammatory activity or anti cancer activity. So, I call that as a hit molecule and then uh, I go and finally, zero in on one candidate I call it as a lead molecule um, the lead molecule is what is being tested in the preclinical clinical trials and these uh, lead molecules should have not only the activity, but other properties which we are going to spend a lot of time on. So, the drug discovery uh, we need to understand the mechanism of action, we need to uh, identify the target which target or enzyme or protein. Uh, it is going to go and bind to and uh, inhibit it or inactivate it. We need to validate that target and then uh, we need to uh, optimize the lead. So, there could be one possible candidate which looks very promising. Uh, so, we may have to change some of its properties so that it increases solubility, maybe the toxicity is reduced, side effects is reduced that is what is called lead optimization. And, um, it should satisfy all the ADME properties. Okay. Yesterday I mentioned A is absorption, D is distribution, M is metabolism and E is excretion. So, it should get absorbed very nicely into the uh, human system, okay. absorbed as we can say and then comes uh, distribution into the bloodstream. Okay, maybe it may get uh, distributed into the uh, various uh, tissues. Okay, then uh, it should get it may be getting metabolized, and then uh, finally, once it has done its job, it should get excreted. That's also very important. So it should satisfy these ADME properties, and then um, the it should have good pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamic property. Okay, yesterday I didn't talk about. Um, pharmacokinetics and uh, pharmacodynamics. Okay. Okay. So, all these uh, and then of course, it should not have any toxicity all these are very important. Uh, so, the drug discovery uh, we are not going to talk about preclinical studies, clinical trials, regulatory approval, sales, marketing and so on actually. Okay. These are not part of the drug discovery process. Okay, so, uh, it is a very long process it involves a lot of money as you can see here um, in silico when we say in silico we use computational tools okay, that is called in silico. Um, in vitro means uh, we use uh, laboratory biochemical assays okay, proteomic assays that is called in uh, vitro. When we say in vivo it means uh, using animals. Okay. So, there are three terms in silico that is the term here which talks uh, using computational tools okay. um, in vitro is laboratory studies and then uh, in animal studies is always called in vivo. Okay. So, there are three types of uh, terminologies which we use. So, the in silico takes uh, 2 to 3 years uh, may cost about 10 million then we go to testing on animals that is the in vivo in between you may you will also have the in vitro also that may take um, another 1 year or more that may cost 10 million dollars. Then we go through the various uh, human volunteer trials okay. um, phase 1, phase 2, phase 3 again you can see uh, 1 year, 1 year maybe 3 years and these are the cost factors. Okay. So, finally, it may add up to almost uh, um, a billion dollar billion US dollars that is the current uh, cost of uh, manufacturing um, sorry current cost of introducing a new molecule into uh, the um, world. 
So, it is a very expensive process and this is taken from this particular reference here. So, as you can see synthesis, extraction, um, if you are a chemist you may be synthesizing new molecule, if you are using natural products you may be extracting and then uh, we are going to test it against maybe anti-cancer uh, drug or anti-inflammatory drug or diapetic related. So, biological text testing then we have toxic ecological studies, pharmaceutical dosage, formulations, then comes the clinical trial, okay, clinical evaluation that is on the human and uh, then uh, phase 4 trials, process development because you need to manufacture in large quantity, then we need to get approval from the regulatory authority looking at bioavailability and so on actually. So, if you look at these cost factors, um, clinical trials contributes to 25 percent uh, and so on actually, okay. Then, um, you are going to regulatory authorities and that also will going to cost a lot of money, biological screening uh, about 12 percent. So, it is an expensive process um, that is why when a drug is introduced, uh, a new drug is introduced into the market, it will be very expensive because cost of, cost of introducing a new drug from the lab is a very expensive process, okay. So, if you look over a period of time, uh, the cost keeps increasing, the R&D cost keeps increasing but the new chemical entities are sort of decreasing that is because the FDA has become more stringent, they want more information, they want to know what are the side effects, um, they want to know the long term uh, toxic effects of the chemical, the toxic effect metabolized product. So, that is why the cost keeps going up and many compounds do not succeed and cross the uh, FDA barrier okay? and that is a big problem nowadays uh, in drug discovery that is a big challenge. So, this is a very interesting slide. Um, so, it may cost about 1 billion or even 1.2 billion US dollars to launch one drug molecule in the market as a new drug I am talking about. If it is already old uh, and um, you want to use that particular drug for some other disease that is called repurposing. For example, aspirin. Aspirin was originally introduced for fever then pain. Uh, later on aspirin is being quite used quite a lot for uh, uh, blood thinning purposes okay that is called a repurposing that will not cost you much. So, it takes about 12 years, 15 years uh, for one new drug. So, it is a very long process okay as you can see very long process. Um, we start with some uh, computational studies here okay uh, that is the computational biology studies we decide on the disease what type of disease you are looking at. Are you looking at inflammation um, and uh, are you looking at uh, cancer of a certain uh, colorectal cancer or breast cancer. So, which tar uh, target I am going to look at okay. So, I need to identify which targets because uh, there could be many enzymes, proteins, um, molecules may uh, are involved and um, your drug may be working on only one particular target. Okay, so, you will I try to identify which target. Once you have identified the target, you start designing molecules and that is what is called a lead identification. Okay, once you have decided, uh, I go for lead identification. Um, so, there are a lot of um, uh, techniques involved if you want to look at the disease mechanism. How does say um, a inflammation progresses starting from the site of inflammation right down to various uh, leukotrienes or prostaglandins. So, what are the various enzymes involved, how is the metabolic pathway. So, I can use computational biology uh, type of approach, um, draw a big network of uh, various uh, uh, pathways and then I can see how the flux flows. So, that is called computational biology. If I want to identify the protein, okay, if I want to identify the protein, uh, then I may use uh, proteomics tools, we will talk little bit on proteomics, but I will not talk too much on that. Uh, trying to identify the protein structure, three dimensional structure, its function, its active site that is all called uh, proteomics. We may have to use some bioinformatics tools, uh, because uh, we may have to compare the protein which you have isolated for your disease, are there similar proteins available, the databases, what are the properties of those protein. So, I can connect with the new unknown protein okay, that is called um, bioinformatics. Then uh, 
the actual discovery of the lead which involves molecular modeling, quantitative structure activity relationship, QSAR means quantitative structure activity relationship. We are going to talk quite a lot about um, this particular uh, portion. activity relationship okay and then um, you need to do the wet lab experiments that is experiment in your lab okay that is where you check uh, the biological activity of your compound you may use uh, uh, bacteria you may use uh, virus you may use uh, um, animal cells whatever is your uh, uh, biological assessment uh, simultaneously, I need to understand the properties of the compound, the lead drug likeness. Does it have the drug likeness property? Now, that means, uh, after all, it is going to be uh, consumed by human, so it should not have uh, uh, certain problems or it should have certain properties uh, like good solubility, good absorption, okay. Uh, that is called drug likeness property. Does it have toxicity, short term toxicity, long term? How is it ADME? See, we keep on introducing this term ADME, it is going to come quite often now. Um, does it have good ADME properties? So, simultaneously, uh, when we are uh, looking at possible candidates and testing it out in the wet lab biological assays, I need to understand these things also. This is very, very important because many drugs uh, may have good activity, but they may be very toxic. Uh, many uh, leaves may have very good activity, but um, in the stomach it gets uh, degraded because uh, as you know the stomach pH is extremely acidic pH of 2. It may have good activity, um, maybe it is toxic or it may have good activity or uh, maybe it gets metabolized inside by the liver and other enzymes involved. So, the active um, drug uh, concentration may be very, very less at the target site. So, uh, the ADME could be very poor, the absorption could be poor, the distribution inside could be very poor um, or it gets metabolized. So, concentration is very poor um, or it does not get excreted from the body. So, it keeps staying inside, uh, it gets accumulated and over a long period of time um, the concentration may be very high which may be toxic. For example, if I am using nanoparticles, metal nanoparticles, they may stay inside the body get absorbed by the tissues because they are nano size and they may have metal toxicity. That is why now uh, use of metal nanoparticles in the body there is a lot of worry uh, because of uh, this particular problem. So, simultaneously when we look at uh, a lead an active molecule we may have to simultaneously look at all these uh, I may have to perform experiments to, to determine all these parameters. Okay, or uh, um, I can use computational tools um, to predict some of the drug likeness property, toxicity, ADME and so on actually. So, the course is predominantly going to cover uh, this molecular modeling QSAR, course is going to cover predominantly uh, some of these uh, uh, computational approaches for uh, determining ADME and drug likeness property. Okay. So, some of course, uh, simultaneously one has to see how to manufacture the drug in large quantities that is called process development, bio process. Uh, it should have the uh, good manufacturing practices approved by FDA and so on. Uh, once uh, a lead is identified, it goes through the animal preclinical trials, then clinical trial 1, 2, 3 and then uh, FDA approval and finally, gets uh, launched. Okay. So, this is the uh, pipeline. Uh, for new drug discovery. So, here we are talking quite a lot about computational approaches, computational biology, proteomics, bioinformatics, here we have the molecular modeling and then here we have the drug likeness, ADME prediction. Okay. So, um, the course is going to cover uh, these two circles, how computers can be used uh, for cal measuring, not measuring, calculating some of these parameters that is what uh, we are going to talk about. So, the drug discovery development process uh, we can call it uh, the discovery stage, the development stage, uh, the registration stage. Okay. Discovery 
uh, like I said target identification, validation, we need to develop the assay. For example, if I am going to study how my drug um, is going to uh, bind to a protein or enzyme and inhibit, I should have a biochemical assay, okay? maybe a, um, a fluorescence assay or a colorimetry assay. Okay? Um, so, I need to or a radioactive assay or I may use a animal cell. I may be looking at some metabolites that are produced. So, assay development is also very, very important. Then uh, once I identify my lead, I need to optimize the lead. That means uh, uh, it is a balance between activity vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, its properties. Okay? So, that is called uh, lead optimization. Okay? Then the pre-development. Of course, the development stage we have the animal studies and uh, clinical uh, studies and then of course, registration, regulatory approval, uh, looking at the uh, life cycle. Uh, sometimes drugs after being introduced into the market may be withdrawn because um, certain things which have not been thought of, it may be having problems actually. That is why phase 4 is like getting feedback from uh, the people who have been using the drug globally um, okay, or in a particular continent and then see if there are any other problems which has not been thought of. Okay? Uh, for example, there are many drugs. You have the anti-inflammatory uh, selective COX-2 inhibitor which was introduced into the market and then it was withdrawn because it had cardiovascular issues on some of those uh, patients who took that. Okay? So, phase 4 is also very important which is like a follow-up. Okay? But uh, as I said, our focus is more on uh, this side of it and uh, nothing to do on that side. Okay, so, uh, in, but still we need to understand little bit on phase 1, phase 2, phase 3 and phase 4. So, there are 4 different phases uh, of operation. Phase 1 involves human pharmacology, phase 2 involves therapeutic exploratory, phase 3 involves therapeutic confirmatory phase 4 like I said post marketing after it has been marketed. In the phase 1 we are looking at uh, any side effects that may be caused by the drug when it is given to healthy volunteers. Um, phase 2 is looking at uh, what is the dose response. Okay? If I give 1 milligram what is the response? For example, it is a bacterial like an antibiotic. If I give 1 milligram how much uh, bacteria is killed? If I give 2 milligram how much bacteria is killed? So, that is called therapeutic exploratory. Then in phase 3, uh, we are looking at long term side effects, that is why it is done for 3 years and so on actually. Okay? Uh, so, phase 1, we are looking at uh, tolerance, we are looking at pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics. Okay? That is a very important thing that happens. Uh, pharmacokinetic is when the drug is given uh, to your patient, it gets little bit absorbed, then it gets uh, excreted. So, in how many hours does it get excreted? What is the maximum concentration of the drug in the body okay, because of uh, the metabolism and absorption? So, that sort of uh, parameters are determined uh, in pharmacokinetics. Okay. So, you may take uh, samples either from the blood or target side and see what is the concentration of the drug and so on. In pharmacodynamics, what the drug does to the uh, patient uh, or the, um, the target. So, if I if the drug is there, uh, does the bacteria go down 10 percent, does it go down 20 percent or if you are looking at a tumor, the, um, is the tumor size goes down as a function of uh, drug concentration. So, pharmacokinetic is what the body does to the drug, pharmacodynamics is what the drug does to the body. Okay? Uh, you also look at uh, drug metabolism and drug interaction and uh, also estimate the activity. In uh, phase 2, you look at uh, where the drug goes and uh, acts. So, you try to look at whether there is an up regulation or down regulation of the target, uh, what is the dosage uh, required to kill uh, a particular amount of uh, bacteria or uh, um, reduce the activity of uh, uh, some uh, proteins. Okay? So, we develop something called dose response curve. So, um, if this is concentration of drug, uh, what is the response? So, initially for some concentration there will not be much response, drug uh, fever goes down by 1 degree Fahrenheit. If I give 2 milligram fever goes down by 5 degree Fahrenheit. So, that is called a dose response curve. Okay? That is what you measure in the phase 2. 
Uh, this also helps you to identify the end points okay when do you stop giving the drug so do i stop um, when the temperature comes down to some certain value do i stop for an inf infection uh, when the amount of infection or bacteria is less than uh, 5000 like that that is called the end points okay so all these are uh, measured in phase 2 then the phase 3 uh, we are looking at uh, safety profiles that is a very very important point in phase 3 the safety profiles um, look at the benefit versus risk because uh, there are cancer anti cancer drugs which could be very toxic to the uh, healthy cells um, but at the same time they may be killing the um, uh, cancerous cells. So we look at the benefit versus risk okay. Uh, if there is a terminally ill patient and the patient will not survive more than 6 months so by giving the drug which may be toxic patient may survive for 2 years so is it worth it so that sort of studies we do actually okay we do all these things in phase 3 then of course phase 4 is uh, after it's been marketed um, is there are any other uh, adverse reactions uh, do i have to again uh, give some warnings to people who are taking the drug after all uh, in the phase 1 phase 2 phase 3 trials uh, the um, it is the drug is tested only for about 1000 volunteers but then when it is given to public at large there could be some new reactions which has not been thought of okay so that is done in phase 4 trials okay so drugs fail a lot of drugs fail mm, very little um, lead compounds get converted as a new drug enters the market lot of drugs fail okay why do they fail okay as you can see 9 out of every 10 new drugs fail in clinical testing okay, 9 out of 10 that means uh, the success is 10 percent or even less a drug in phase 3 testing has 32 percent chance of failure that means uh, uh, it is crossed phase 1 it is crossed phase 2 but still it can fail um, because it has crossed phase 1 and phase 2 uh, the percentage failure rate is much lower when compared to this rate here the success is only uh, 10 percent or 90 percent failure uh, once it has crossed phase 3 success uh, the failure percentage is only 30 percent because at each phase uh, the pharma company spends uh, millions of dollars um, so if the drug fails and it has to be withdrawn they have lost lot of money so only 20 percent of drugs that enter phase 1 make it to the market 20 percent that means remaining 80 percent fail so whatever money they have spent goes down the drain so that is why computational tools are being widely used uh, so that we try to find out uh, uh, failure possible failure compounds and do not take it further phase 1 50 percent fail 50 percent phase 2 30 percent and phase 3 25 to 50 percent so overall success rate is 3 to 8 percent so like I said here 10 percent okay and the percentage of drugs failed for neurological diseases is higher okay because neurological disease are much complicated the drug has to enter uh, the brain region and then do its job um, whereas uh, remaining drugs like inflammation or cancer or stomach pain or fever they do not have to go to the brain region okay um, so um, the requirements are very different so that is why percentage of drugs failed for neurological disease is higher 200 candidates failed for Alzheimer's disease in clinical testing okay Alzheimer's disease is more to do with the loss of memory and so on actually okay but uh, they have been tested in rats or mice that means preclinical trials they work but when it comes to human uh, volunteer trial it fails okay so of course there is a difference between uh, the, uh, the system of rats uh, mice versus human but still rats and mice is used widely in preclinical trials because they are the closest uh, to human volunteers and they are much cheaper okay so many drugs stop working when tested in people okay why is that maybe toxicity maybe when it was tested in animal uh, slight elevation of uh, some liver enzyme which was not uh, taken very seriously but it, when it was given to human um, the enzyme level may be getting elevated too much 
even if there is one random fluctuation in hundreds of tests, then uh, they decide that that drug is not very safe and it has to be withdrawn, okay. One in 100, okay, that is very, very, very tough business. Poor biopharmaceutical properties, like I mentioned, maybe solubility is very poor, maybe um, absorption is poor, um, maybe metabolism is happening either in the stomach or in the liver region because of various enzymes present, okay, it is not getting excreted properly or it gets excreted very fast, um, it is not, uh, it is getting distributed too much and that means the concentration of the um, drug in the blood is so low, um, all these 39 percent. Lack of efficacy, um, that means the concentration at the target site is not uh, sufficient. Okay. Imagine I have um, um, a pain in my finger and um, I take a drug called ibuprofen, I am sure all of us would have taken ibuprofen. Okay. So, the drug um, is taken orally, so we have the GI uh, that is the gastrointestinal, then it gets absorbed into the blood, okay. then uh, you also have uh, this uh, liver uh, which keeps uh, degrading this. Okay, then uh, it which is a uh, wasted and then finally it reaches the target. If it does not get absorbed properly from the GI, again it gets uh, wasted okay, to the fecus. Um, if, it, uh, if the liver degrades this, um, it comes out through the urine, again it is waste. Um, so, finally it reaches the target. Okay. So, the concentration of the drug in the target is much, much less then the concentration of the drug taken by us um, orally. Okay. So, it might not be sufficient to perform its duty. For example, if I am looking at antibacterial drug, um, I, uh, the concentration of the drug should be sufficiently larger than the minimum inhibitory concentration okay, of the bacteria, it is called MIC. So, if the concentration of the drug at the target site is very, very low, um, that drug is of no use that is called lack of efficacy, okay, understand. Then toxicity, the drug has toxicity or the metabolites, uh, the, uh, the um, drug gets uh, degraded in the liver, maybe those metabolites are toxic, uh, short term toxicity, long term toxicity, so 21 percent. So, you see if you add all these 39, 29, 21, it is a huge number, okay, and uh, so the properties of the drug is very, very important. Okay. The ADME properties, uh, the efficacy as, as we can see which I explained here, um, because of lack of efficacy, um, then of course, toxicity, um, many, many, many drugs fail during uh, the development process either preclinical or clinical trials actually. So, one need to put in lot of uh, uh, focus in this area. Um, not only just looking at the activity in my lab, um, anti-cancer activity is showing very good activity against certain cell lines, but I need to also understand the physico-chemical properties of the molecule um, also, so that uh, I can design a molecule which satisfies all these conditions in addition to good activity. So, that is very, very important. So, a drug is not only uh, doing very well in the lab because it is showing a um, very good activity, but it should also have all the properties, okay, the biopharmaceutical properties um, and also this uh, good efficacy, uh, so that it passes the clinical trials and um, it gets approved. Okay. We are going to, that is why we are going to spend lot of time on these aspects uh, um, as well and not only just looking at uh, a candidate which shows very good uh, uh, activity or which has very good inhibitory power against an enzyme or a protein uh, and so on. And of course, uh, toxicity is another big issue, um, one needs to do a lot of experimental studies on fish, on animals and so on to identify toxicity and uh, there are different uh, uh, computational tools also which can uh, help you to predict toxicity um, of uh, compounds, the metabolites and so on. So, um, in the next few weeks, 
we are going to talk more about this before we actually jump into uh, the uh, predicting the activity of uh, um, various lead molecules. Okay? So, we will talk more in the next class. Thank you very much for your time.